what's going on. It's personal. <laughs> Actually, Marty, could you pray for us to begin? Okay, let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our dear Master and our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, we thank you because of your grace and mercy and your love, which you poured into each and every one of our lives. We thank you, dear Lord, for this opportunity, dear Lord, to hear about your work through your children, reaching to the ends of the world, dear Lord. We know that you have a compassion and care for all people and don't desire that a single one should be lost. Dear Lord, we're gathered here to see the great things that you desire to do, not only through John and Rose, but potentially through all of us. I pray, dear Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds and give John and Rose a word to speak. We pray, dear Lord, that you watch over them while they're here and allow them to be a blessing to all those who hear them. We ask, dear Lord, that you watch over their baby and allow the Lord to be a child of peace and blessing to them and to all of us. We ask your presence and uh, great, great strength upon us right now. Through the intercession of St. Mary, Archangels Michael and Gabriel, all the martyrs, prophets, and saints, hear us when we, your children, cry unto you with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. How many of you does John look familiar to you? John is saying he sees more people here from St. John than when he went to St. John last week. So it's nice to see that this is a reunion for all of us. So I'm going to go ahead and let John and Rosa take over. <laughs> um, thank you for inviting me here. It's very good to be here. It's very good to be in California again. It's been a, a long time. Uh, we haven't been back in three years, so it's very nice to be here. Um, when I was praying about what to speak about today, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, God led me in this direction. And so I'm actually going to spend most of my time today talking about the process that led us to India. Um, well, I'll show you a little bit about what we're doing in India at the end, but uh, God really led me to speak a little bit about the process that led our hearts to uh, find this call for us. And so up on the screen, I have a quote from St. Justin Martyr, one of the uh, very first fathers, very first uh, martyrs of the church from the middle of the second century. And it says, we who hated and destroyed one another and on account of our different manners would not live with men of a different tribe. Now, since the coming of Christ, live familiarly with them and pray for our enemies and endeavor to persuade those who hate us unjustly to live conformably to the good precepts of Christ, to the end that they may be partakers with us the same joyful hope of reward from God, the ruler of all. Um, and so that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about today, about this process from moving from uh, hatred and resentment and difference and division into uh, shared love. So this is our little family. That's myself and Rosie. And this is our foster daughter, Chaya. Chaya's been with us for the last two years. Um, she's right now doing an internship in Bangalore, about a thousand miles from home. And so it's sort of a scary thing because we're on the other side of the world and she's a long ways from home. But uh, last night at two o'clock in the morning, we got to talk. It's the only time we can talk, unfortunately. Um, but we got to talk at two o'clock in the morning and she's doing really well right now. So we're really happy for her. Uh, these pictures are up there just to show you that I grew up really, really white. <laughs> um, in fact, um, the town that I grew up in was more than 99% white. And in fact, I realized when I was preparing the talk, I realized uh, my, grand, my grandmother's brother married a Korean woman. And besides that, besides going to her home, I had never stepped inside the house of a non-white person's home uh, until I left for college. Like my entire upbringing, I only knew white people. And um, I just have to point out that that's a fantastic 
band uniform in the middle there. And um, when I was growing up, I wasn't exposed to much racism, mostly because there wasn't anyone to be racist against when everybody is the same. Um, I did hear people use the N-word a couple of times. Um, I heard racist jokes in school on occasion, but they were, they were sort of lighthearted because there was no targets to them. You'd hear these racist jokes, but the people they were talking about weren't even there at all. Uh, it wasn't actually much later in my life I learned more of Oregon's history. This might be uh, really crazy to hear, but in 1844, Oregon banned all black people from the state. They passed a law, an official law. This is not official, this is all on the books. They passed a law in 1844 banning all black people from entering the state. The penalty, if you were black and you were in the state, was 20 to 39 lashings for each six months you stayed. If they lashed you and you stayed six months, they lashed you again, and they kept doing it until you left. They reaffirmed the law and added more penalties to it in 1847 and then again in 1859, and they were admitted into the United States as a new state in 1860, still not allowing black people into the state. They didn't officially repeal the law until 1926. Um, that's probably one of the reasons why, till this day, Oregon's less than 2% black, and my hometown that I grew up in was less than one-tenth of 1% black. Um, I had heard a story, I don't know if it's true or not, I'd heard a story in my town that a black family had tried to move in once, and that people had drove pickup trucks through their front yard and sent them threatening messages and stuff until they left. This is a story I heard, I didn't know if it was true because I didn't know any black families when I grew up, so they, they, I didn't wasn't even able to see that sort of behavior. But it's, it was an undercurrent there. And it's really crazy to think about, especially how recently it is. Uh, interracial marriage was banned in Oregon until 1951. And until 1968, there were sundown towns. Has anyone here heard of a sundown town? There are sundown towns in California too. It's a town where a black person could not stay in the town past sundown. If they were there in the town, they had to leave before sundown to go to the next town because no black people were allowed to sleep overnight in the town. That lasted in some Oregon towns until 1968. But I didn't know all that growing up because we didn't talk about that. We didn't talk about our history at all. I just knew that we didn't really have black people and I heard some people saying some things, but I didn't know any more than that. <clears throat> when I went to college, I ended up going to college down here in Southern California. I went to Harvey Mudd College and the Claremont Colleges. And I got to see more diversity. Um, it's still a college where less than 1% of the people are black, but I met Asian people and actually met people from a different culture and spent time with a different culture for the first time in my entire life. And that was a bit eye-opening. Um, it was a new experience to me, but it was still only got a little bit partial experience. And uh, then the really big thing that happened is that during my sophomore year in college, I came to Christ and I started following Jesus. And that made me start thinking about a lot of things in life that I hadn't thought much before. It was a really crazy period for me because before I did that, I was 19 years old, sophomore in college, and until then I didn't know anything about God. Uh, my mom was Catholic and my mom made me go to church, but I didn't pay any attention. I never read the Bible. I never tried to follow in any way. And so when I became a Christian my sophomore year, everything was new. I'd go to church. I'd go to a Bible study. I'd hear people say things and I'd try to apply them to my life. And it was like my life would change every single week. Every single week I'd learn new things and things I hadn't thought about before and things that uh, moved me to live differently. Making sure I haven't skipped anything. And so one of the things that I learned differently that was really new to me was the way that Jesus worked towards reconciliation and the importance of reconciliation to Jesus. You see this quote from Ephesians there. He is our peace, you see. He has made the two to be one. He has pulled down the barrier, the dividing wall that turns us into enemies of each other. And of course, Paul there is speaking specifically of the barrier between Gentiles and Jews. That was one of the biggest divisions there, but there are other divisions too. And you see Jesus stepping into those divisions all the time. Um, I'm sure you guys talk about the Samaritans, and you have some familiarity with who the Samaritans were. Um, not all of it is recorded in the Bible, but some of the tensions between them are really, really severe. In about 100 years before Jesus was born, the Jews actually went through and destroyed all the Samaritan temples, destroyed all their places of worship. 
And so that was a historical memory of what they had done that the Samaritans were very bitter about. And then when Jesus would have been about seven years old, um, there was an incident where the Samaritans brought a bunch of human bones and snuck them into the temple and spread them out in the temple to desecrate the temple. They desecrated the, the temple of God with human remains. And that was obviously seen as really, really offensive to the Samaritans. The uh, idea of how violent it could get, uh, a little later, actually, in Paul's time, around 50 um, AD, the, uh, there was an incident where a Samaritan killed a Galilean. And the Galileans retaliated by going to the Samaritan uh, region, and they basically started massacring people. They started killing people in mass and retaliation, and the Romans actually had to come in, the Roman soldiers had to come in and stop it. But it gives you an idea of how heightened the tensions were between the Jews and the Samaritans. Yet Jesus confounded people's expectations about them. He went into Samaria, went to a well, and started speaking to a Samaritan woman, crossing two barriers at once, speaking to a woman, which was really not expected in that culture, and speaking to a Samaritan, and really surprised the disciples. He went to a Canaanite woman, and he healed her daughter. First he said he wasn't going to do it, and then she pressed him, and he's like, yes, you know, I will do it for you your faith, because of your faith. He went to a Roman centurion, and he not only healed the Roman slave, but he praised his faith. If you imagine how shocking that would be to hear a Jewish person praise the faith of a non-Jew. And he didn't just go to these people across barriers. He didn't just go to the Samaritans, to the Gentiles, to the Romans. But he even said things about them to the other Jewish people that would have really confounded them. When he tells that story of the Good Samaritan, and the Samaritan isn't being the hero of the story, that was a shocking thing. How can you make the Samaritan a hero? How can the Samaritan be the one who helped the Jewish traveler when the priest and the rabbi, or the priest and the Levite weren't doing it? Or he tells the story of the Samaritan, the lepers he had healed. He healed 10 lepers, but only one of those lepers came back. And that one who came back was a Samaritan. And so, and he talked about the publican, where the Pharisee couldn't justify himself because he was talking about how much better he was than the others. But the publican was justified in his humility. These stories really confounded people. I want to do one passage in particular, Luke 4 that shows how people could react to this sort of confounding. Uh, Luke 4 is very early in the Gospels, and a lot of people see it as sort of a mission statement for Jesus, because he's announcing what's going to happen in his ministry right at the beginning of it. And so Jesus goes up to read in the synagogue on the seventh day, and he goes to the scroll of Isaiah, it's like Isaiah 61, it speaks in the beginning, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolls up the scroll. Now there's something missing there. Does anyone know what's missing from there? This is actually not the full verse. If you go to it, there's one more line in the verse where it says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of judgment of our God. And he skips that part. He leaves that out, and the people notice that. Because it says that all the eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, today the scripture has been filled in your hearing. And the people start going, who is this? This is just, you know, the son of Joseph, isn't it? Because he was in his hometown. He's in Nazareth when he's saying this. This is just the son of Joseph. Who's this to be able to be saying this? And you don't understand the tension that's there unless you see that skipped verse. But Jesus reads exactly what they're saying. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is this. There were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Jesus is saying something really, really controversial. 
because the Jewish expectation was twofold. It was the expectation that one day the Messiah would come and he would save the people. He would save the Jewish people. He would show them to be in the right. He would take them away from their oppressors. But the second part about it was, and he would judge those oppressors. He would destroy the Gentiles. He would put them in their place. And so this idea of the Messiah wasn't always just the Messiah who was going to bring glory and bring connection with God to the people, but also one who was going to judge all their enemies. And Jesus sort of saying to them, you know, the people who you view as your enemies right now, maybe God is coming for them too. Maybe just like Elijah went to a Gentile, Elisha went to a Gentile. I have been called to the Gentiles too. And he's confounding the expectations about what God is going to do through him. So that was one of the things that I learned out of many things that I was learning as I became a new Christian this first year. And it was also the time that I started learning more about U.S. history for the first time. I decided to do some reading U.S. history. I knew that I had never learned U.S. history. And so I started reading about the Civil War, about Reconstruction, about the backlash to Reconstruction and the KKK and the Jim Crow laws, about the Civil Rights Movement. And I started learning a whole history that where I grew up had been hidden from me, hadn't existed before. Uh, these pictures right here, you can see uh, Martin Luther King Jr. in the pictures there. Does anyone know who's standing next to him? He looks... Yakovos. Exactly, Archbishop Yakovos. I'm very impressed. I would not have come up with his name off the top of my head at all. Archbishop Yakovos, who was the Archbishop of Greece, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church across the USA. Uh, these pictures are from Selma. Actually, the, the lower right-hand one is actually from the movie Selma itself. The other three are all real pictures of the Archbishop. And when he saw what Martin Luther King Jr. was doing, he had a feeling from his own childhood of what it meant to be oppressed because he had lived in a region that was religiously oppressed. And he said, we have to stand with the oppressed. We have to go to them. And he also felt that the Greek Orthodox Church, even though they were newer to America, that they had to join in with the societal issues that were going on in America. He felt that to really be a part of the country, they had to take part in the social issues that were going on. And so he was the only white bishop who marched in Selma. And he marched side by side with Martin Luther King Jr. You can actually see that Martin Luther King Jr. is carrying a wreath in, in that picture. Um, those two pictures, the, one on, the two on the top, those are both pictures actually from a memorial service for uh, Pastor Reed. I believe he was an Anglican pastor who was murdered by white racists for the fact that he was at the rally. So this isn't some uh, minor gesture. In fact, uh, Archbishop Yakovos received hundreds of death threats, literally hundreds of death threats. And do you know who he got the death threats from? His own people. He received hundreds of de death threats from his own congregants, because what he was doing was considered so against the norm, was considered so wrong for him to be doing that. But he stood by it for his entire life. The picture in the lower corner there is him with Coretta Scott King. I believe that's the 40th or the 35th anniversary of Selma right there. And he continued to stand with the community for his entire life. So. These two strains are going on in my life. I was learning more about the history of um, race in America and the really, uh, at times, violent and divisive history that's been there. And I was learning about Jesus' desire to reconcile people and Jesus' willingness to cross boundaries and to try to bring the message of God to people uh, where there had been division. And so four months after I became a Christian, I was uh, at a Bible study, a week-long Bible study that we did. We studied the middle five chapters of the Book of Mark for an entire week, uh, 10 hours a day each day. It was really, really intense. And in the middle of the week, we were going over Mark 8, 34 to 37. And the part, it's the part where Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. For all those who try to save their life will lose it. But all those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, 
but lose his soul. And we, we discussed for like two hours what that meant. Because we were all new Christians. Like I said, I've only been a Christian for four months. Most of the other people there were pretty new Christians too. And so what does it mean to lose your life? Do you have to be a martyr? And we were discussing it and going in circles and people giving up different ideas. And after two hours, our study leader said, okay, we're actually in the mountains. We're on uh, Mount Palomar, Palomar Mountain uh, in uh, San Diego County. And he said, I want you to go out, go out into the woods and pray about it. Pray to God about it. So I went out and I sat on a boulder and I was praying to God. And one part of my story I didn't share is I'm actually um, a scientist by background. Uh, Harvey, if you know Harvey Mudd College, you know I have to be because that's all they produce there. Um, I was studying biophysics. I was uh, working to do an internship, internship with NASA. And my plan was to finish my PhD and be an astrobiologist at NASA. And I was thinking about this as I sat on that boulder. And I was thinking, my plan for my life is really ambitious, and it's going to require a lot of hard work. And I'm going to be really, really busy. And I said, God, how can I lose my life for you if I'm going to be so busy with these other goals? And God said to me, don't worry about that. You're going to teach in the inner city instead. And it surprised me. It took me by complete surprise. I didn't hear an audible voice. But it was more like a thought that was given to me in the third person instead of in the first person. Don't worry about that. Is this a calming, you know, do not fear. You're going to teach in the inner city instead. And so from that moment, I decided that that was God's call for me. I finished my degree and then got certified as a teacher and moved to Inglewood and lived inside a black community in Inglewood. Oh, I had the verse up there. Uh, lived inside a black community in Inglewood and taught science, taught biology and physics uh, in middle school and in high school. Um, I also coached. I coached basketball and football. Uh, I was a neighbor. I, I felt really, really important to me that you can't serve somebody unless you really know them, unless you're a part of their community. And so I had to be a part of the community to, to be really sane that I was serving the community. So I lived right on 99th Street on Century and Crenshaw in Inglewood uh, for five years. And it was a really blessed time for me. It was a really beautiful time. And while I was there, I started learning a new lesson from God. I came to serve the black community. That's what I saw as, as God's role for me. And initially, I came just to give. It was the idea that I'm just going to come into this community I have, I have all this background, you know, I have this great training in science, I have this great desire to teach, I was a very natural teacher, and I can give this to them, and I can share my faith, and I can share what God has taught me, and I can bring some sort of justice there, and some sort of reconciliation there. And it was all about what I was giving. But I began to realize after a while that it actually goes both ways. At the same time as I was giving from the, to them, I was learning from them at the same time. At the same time, while I was trying to be a neighbor to them, they were being a neighbor to me. And I made some really close friends there and had some really good relationships and even learned a lot from my own students. Um, like I love every one of these guys in these pictures. Rashad, Darnell, Daryl, um, Cameron. They just, they're still in my hearts today. I had a lot of really blessed interaction with them. And that's when I realized something that Jesus did that needed to be an important part of my life too. Jesus didn't just go to the Samaritans and to the Gentiles, to the tax collectors, to the sinners, but he brought something back from them to the Jewish people. His mission of reconciliation wasn't just all go to them, but also I need to come back and heal this divide in my own people. And so just like Jesus came back and told stories of his interactions with Samaritans and his interactions with Gentiles and gave his people a different picture of them than the one they'd got before, I realized that part of my mission from God had to be to speak to my own people and to share with them my experiences too and try to bridge that divide in some way. So there's a verse in Proverbs.
Speak up for the speak out for those who cannot speak for the rights of all the destitute. Speak out, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. I believe it's a really central part of the life God's given me to speak out for people who faced injustice, to speak out for people who've been oppressed, to speak in places where those people don't have a voice. Everybody has some sort of voice in some context, but there's certain places where those people don't have a voice. And some of those are places that I can step into, that I can have a voice in. And so I feel like God has told me to speak out for them. Uh, a good friend of mine named Troy, who, uh, who serves God in Bangladesh and Thailand, actually has taken this uh, verse as his mission statement. The name of his organization is Speak Up. When I started training to become a teacher, um, I studied a lot of psychology. I thought, you have to understand how kids work. You have to understand their minds to be a good teacher. But, so I thought, thought being um, someone who is very aware of how our minds worked would help me be a teacher. So I studied a lot of psychology. And a lot of psychological experiments, uh, they sort of confound you. They sort of confound your expectations. And one of the ones that did that for me was the study of how people change. They studied how people change political parties. They looked at a lot of people over time, and they pulled them and found out what their beliefs were on a wide range of issues, and they found out what part, political party they adhered to. And then they followed them over time. Every year they pulled them again to see if any of their beliefs had changed. And you might think that when people change political parties, it's because, oh, they changed some of their beliefs, and now they realize they align with this other party more than they did with the previous one. Studies find that's usually not true. That can happen, but it's usually not true. People don't change their beliefs first. They change their beliefs second. They don't change their beliefs until after they've changed their party. So you might ask, if they didn't change their beliefs, then why would they change party? The actual reason most people change their political parties is because of affinity for some person. They see a person who they like. They see a person who they have affinity with, and they say, well, I want to spend more time around that person. I want to be like that person. And they, after they have the affinity to that person, they see that person as a part of this party, and that's what gets them to switch the party. And then after they switch the party, they might say, oh, I agree with them on this stuff, but not on all this other stuff. But then over time, you give them two years, three years, five years in that context, and they agree with more and more and more of those things. So when they did the study of people, they found that usually people change because of a role model or because of someone they have affinity with. And then after the fact, they change all their beliefs on the issues and that sort of thing. And I think this is much broader than politics. I think this goes for faith too. I think this goes for um, a lot of our community sort of adherences is that we're much more attracted to people than we are to ideas. We're much more attracted to role models than we are to abstract concepts. And so if you want to see people change, it's more about who you are than what you say to them. Unfortunately, this can go in some really negative directions. They found that one of the strongest places for initial affinity, one of the strongest ways in which you can get somebody to have affinity for you, is if you have a shared resentment. If you both hate the same thing, that's how it starts. So if both of you start talking about how much you hate uh, the California government or how much you hate, um, what could be some immigrants, if you talk about how much you hate liberal colleges or liberal professors, Start discussing these sort of things. And that's the beginning of the shared affinity. That's one of the most strongest ways that shared affinity can build. And so this shared resentment is a very powerful force. And it can be used in very powerful ways. But I would submit that it's also a very destructive force. That not everything that has power is good. And so I see Jesus as stepping into these shared resentments. Because in the first century, 
the shared resentments were one of the few things that were really holding the Jewish community together. If you look at the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, they believed very different things, and they had a lot of issues with each other. But some of the few things they could agree upon is their shared resentment of the Samaritans, or their shared resentment of the Roman soldiers. The Sadducees a little less so, but they still tried to say they were with the people on that. And so it's very communally bonding to have this shared resentment. But it can also be very dangerous because it can cause you to start missing what God's message actually is. So after I'd lived in Inglewood for some time, um, God brought a young lady into my life, Rosie. And um, we both had started feeling this call from God, that God was calling us to a second stage. Uh, my service in Inglewood was going really well and I was really happy with it. But some circumstances came up that exposed me to things that were happening in India. And some other things came up that exposed me to the Muslim community. And I started feeling a very deep call from God to take what I had been doing within the black community in the US and go to a place where the needs were even greater, where the poverty was much deeper, where education was much less. Um, it was just by chance that I visited Mumbai in 2004, and I saw some communities that were like nothing I'd ever seen in America. Just absolutely shocking to me. And I felt God telling me, this is where I want you to serve next. It took me a long time. I prayed about it for months before I was sure that that's what I was supposed to be doing. But it was my call. And so a uh, little while after I got that call, we got engaged and we got married, which put it off a little bit, but by 2010, we were able to move to Asia. And in 2012, we moved into this slum in India. And that's been our home for the last six years. And again, I feel my call is too pronged. Part of my call is to share the love of God, to share the gospel of Jesus with the people who I'm living amongst. Not just to preach, it's actually completely illegal for me to preach and to get kicked out of the country if I started preaching on the corner or anything else like that. But to demonstrate with my life who Jesus is. To serve people, to love people, to talk with people, to live amongst the people. To show them what I believe Jesus wants for them. And then when they ask me why I'm doing that, to share with them my own story. and To share with them how God led me to this place in life. But it's also, I feel, a calling for me to come back from time to time and share my experiences in the Muslim community and share how my neighbors have loved me and try to find ways that we can reach out to each other more, that we can go into these communities more, cross these lines more, and that we can show people the kind of love that Jesus showed them. The love that says that we are to love our enemy the same way we love our neighbor. And the way that love that says we are to know, love our neighbor as ourselves, which means we are to love our enemy as ourselves. So this is our community. been through a lot of good things there and a lot of heartbreak. We've had people take care of us really, really well while we've been there. And there's been times when we've had to take care of people. Um, we've shared a lot of life there. It's weird. I've been, I've been away from there for a couple months now. And um, it's weird to be gone because it does feel like home. It feels like USA is a foreign country now and it feels like India is my home. Um, not speaking Hindi is really weird to me, not speaking Hindi or Urdu. I want to end by just talking about two friends of mine. This is Shamim right here, and this is uh, Latif Khan right there. Um, Shamim is one of my best friends. 
Uh, I've known him for six years now. He lives in the same uh, slum that I do. He's lived there since he was born. Uh, he's had a very, very difficult life. Uh, incredible amount of struggles in his life. I'm not going to go over all. It's more his own story. I don't want to get too deep uh, into his own story. But um, he's had a very, very tough life. But he has strived incredibly during that time. He's finished two years of college, which is incredible for a young man from the slums, from poverty, where most, most boys don't go past the 10th grade, and he's already gotten two years of college. Um, he strives to serve in his community. And before I ever came, he was helping as a tutor in his community. As we became friends and as I helped him in college and I helped him with his English studies and that sort of thing, uh, he began working with me. A couple years into my time, I started a literacy program in the community. And you can see in that picture right there, that's actually inside of our house. And I'm right there uh, teaching one kid how to read, and she means they're teaching another kid how to read. And for three years now almost, uh, Shamim has helped me teach kids how to read in the community. And we talk a lot. Well, one day Shamim came to me and he told me, you want to hear what just happened? You want to hear what just happened? My brother came to me and he was saying, Hindus are bad people. And I asked him, who made Hindus? And he didn't answer me. So I told him, God made Hindus. And so how can something God made be bad? How can you be calling them bad people if God made them? They're children of God too, and you should love them too. And he said, and then the same day, my aunt told me that I couldn't eat the puri from the Hindus. On certain uh, Hindu festivals, one of the ways they serve on their festivals is they give out free food to the community. But many of the Muslims say, if it's made in a Hindu home, you can't eat it. And so my aunt told me I couldn't eat the free puri from the Hindus. And I asked her, why not? And she said, because those Hindus, they drink alcohol. So I said, have you ever eaten in my home? And she said, yes, of course I've eaten at your home. I said, well, I have drinking alcohol twice. And so it was just a cute story to me, partly because Shamim was looking at this resentment that was going on and trying to break through it a little bit, trying to break through these Muslim Hindu barriers a little bit and trying to get more love in the community. And second of all, because he was so happy to tell these stories to me. Because he knew from seeing me operate in the community, he knew that those were the kind of stories I would appreciate. He knew that that's the thing that was close to my heart. And I was really happy to see that Shamim would see that was close to my heart. Uh, Latif Khan comes from a very different background. He's from Hyderabad. And he actually runs a, a private school network of 20,000 students. So he has authority over 20,000 students, and he's involved in several All India Muslim organizations and is actually a very powerful uh, person in the Muslim community in India. And he was attending an education conference that I was speaking at. Uh, my NGO does an does a annual education conference in Lucknow, uh, where we bring in uh, educators from all over the world to sort of speak about uh, new educational practices and try to bring better education to uh, people in India. It's usually attended by 400 or 500 educational leaders from across the country. And Latif Khan was there uh, to learn more about our literacy program. Because at this event, I spoke about the literacy program we've been running. And he has to speak at the end of the event. And he came up to the front. And he said, I have had a vision for three years now that every Muslim child in India should be literate. And I've wanted every child to be literate, every Muslim child to be literate. But after hearing John speak today, I believe my vision is too small. And I believe I should fight for the literacy of every child in India. And this was just incredible for him to hear, not just that he believed it, but he was willing to say that in front of this huge group of people, this huge group of leaders. Uh, the day after the conference ended, uh, Latif took, Latif sir took 13 of his fellow educators and they all piled into our room in the slum. It's actually a pretty funny picture because about how many, four of them were outside? 
Yeah, I think four of them had to stand outside because we live in a very small room, and so it cannot fit 14 people. Um, but they sat in my slum for three hours to ask me, why did I come to India? Why did I come to the slum? Why did I want to share these things? How do you start this? How do you encourage people like us, middle class or upper class people, to serve in poor communities? And we sat there for three hours and talked about that. He said, I'm going to come back. And he flew to Hyderabad. Hyderabad's on the completely other side of the country from Lucknow. He flew to Hyderabad, and then four days later, he flew back with his whole family, with his wife and his four children. His children were second year in college with his oldest son. His next son was a senior in high school. And then he had two daughters who were juniors and sophomores in high school, second and third year in high school. And we spent three days where we took them to our slum every day and brought them to my literacy program and trained them how to start a literacy program and how to serve people in the slum. And they sat with me together. And uh, a few months after that, he brought me to Hyderabad. And you can see that picture right there is of a little room that's uh, in the slum community in Hyderabad. His sons are on either side. See on the far left and the far right are Latif's sons. And I'm sort of in the right-hand side in the middle. And everyone else is uh, kids and adults who live in the slum, young men who wanted to learn how to read. And I want to go back. I've been talking about these shared resentment as sort of a theme today. But I want to go back to the other thing I said, too, about affinity. When people's minds change, especially with really big changes, it starts with having affinity to something. I think what Shamim and what Latif saw was my willingness to come to their community and be a part of it. And they appreciated that from me. And that's more than anything I had to say what attracted them. And now they want to be people like that too. People who break through barriers 